Hi, and welcome to the Restorative Wellness Clinician's Corner, a video series exclusively for functional health professionals, where we interview the top experts in the latest research, products, tools, and best practices for getting your clients exceptional results. Welcome, everybody. I am so excited for today's episode of the RWS Clinician's Corner. We have with us today David Roberts and Dr. John Gilday, who have come up with a supplement that has personally changed things dramatically for me, and that I'm really excited to share with you. Um, so welcome, David and John. I'm going to give your bios in a second, but you want to say hi so everyone can see you? Hey, Margaret. Thanks for having us. Yeah, oh. Nice to see you again. It's good to so see you a lot of faces. So David Roberts holds his MPA from Johns Hopkins, a master's in BME from the UVA, and a bachelor's in EE and BME from Duke. And he will teach you how to interpret all of those acronyms afterwards. Uh, David has more than 20 years of public health experience on three different continents. And in 2014, David co-founded the gut supplement you may have heard of, Restore, which is now called ION. And now he is doing fabulous things with Mara Labs, which we're going to hear about in just a moment. Dr. John Gilday is a cell pathophysiologist and molecular gen geneticist with 33 years of scientific research experience at the bench in both industrial and academic labs. A guiding principle of his work is to establish innovative, optimized model systems and assays in order to robustly investigate both normal and pathological states. He has extensive expertise establishing and investigating in vivo, ex vivo, primary and immortalized cell culture systems, molecular biology, antibody-based and nucleic acid-based diagnostic assay development, electron and fluorescence microscopy, and flow cytometry. Dr. Gilday has published 63 peer-reviewed articles, three book chapters, three reviews, three patents, and has 3,173 citations. So once again, we are in fantastic hands. Welcome, David and John. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. Good to be here. I We're going to talk all about sulforaphane today. And I would love you to start off by sharing the story of how this, do we call it a nutrient? Do we call it a molecule? Became incredibly important to you. Yeah. And so um, again, it's, again, thanks everyone for joining tonight. Um, so sulforaphane is the good molecule that comes from broccoli. And so um, I got interested in it uh, over, I guess, 11 years ago now, after um, my wife, Maura, was diagnosed with breast cancer. And so um, we ended up growing her cells in our lab. Um, and uh, John was able to find uh, that sulfurifen was number three and directly killing her type of cancer. And so when I went out to buy it, though, um, I couldn't find it because it wasn't stable. And so all the broccoli supplements on the market at the time and all but two now are um, the precursor molecule that comes before sulfurifen called glucoraphanin. And so um, so what we ended up doing it to, is just uh, growing lots and lots of broccoli sprouts and juicing them. And, um, and so we did that for a while. And I think... I had made the passing comment to John, sure, you know, it would be nice to have sulfurifen in the capsule that was stabilized. Uh, Cause at the time we had a one and three year old. And so, and then you're like how I'd have sprouting a sprouting operation for like 10 families, you know, for that we would go through it, you know, um, cause we were juicing every day. And so, um, and so two couple, couple years later, John's like, hey, I think I stabilized it. I was like, what? And so we sent it out third party testing and sure enough, he had stabilized it. And then, um, 
you know, since I we were uh, both with John's also with uh, Help Found, um, Restore, and Ion. Um, and so we were both with that company and we we're like, let, you know, we'll hold off on that. And Mara was like, we got to get this to people because it's, it can be a game changer because there are over 2000 research papers and a whole center at Johns Hopkins called the Kingdom Productive Institute based on sulfurofen. And wow. so she ended up raising the seed money and then um, starting to raise the seed money. And then she ended up uh, taking a turn for the worse pretty quickly and, uh, and died um, five years ago. But, but um, so yeah, that's kind of how we got interested and, you know, a lot of um, how we test the products we ha do and how, how John tests them is based on, you know, we still put them on cancer cells. We have, he has a whole battery of cancer cells. He can put them on, um, but certainly breast cancer cells, we always throw our supplements on to see, to see what, what the, what happens to them. Wow. So beautiful doing this, um, in her honor and sort of helping with her legacy, getting this, this product into people's hands in a much more stable form. Question number one is, you know, just, just to kind of get this off the table, if somebody is going out to buy sulforaphane, am, am I saying it right now? Now I get confused because I've always thought sulforaphane, but, um, sulforaphane, <laughs> Um, I, think it, I think it's just, it's, it, I think we, we call it both and we okay. call it both tonight. <laughs> okay. Okay. I won't be self-conscious about how I call what I call it then. That sounds good. So what if, you know, cause we, I have actually used sulforaphane in other products, but it's a different thing than in yours. So tell us what, if somebody is looking at a bottle on a shelf or, you know, on full script and they're seeing sulforaphane, what is the form that is not bioavailable um, versus what is the form that is truly bioavailable? And can you explain a little bit? I'd love to go in depth. So we've got practitioners here and we like to geek out. So don't, you know, you can, you can go into the nitty gritty with us in terms of the different mechanisms, et cetera. I think, I mean, you know, um, John um, can jump in too, but I mean, how I talk about it is um, basically um, if you have a head of broccoli, take a bite of it, you start chewing it, there's the, a compound in it called glucoraphanin. And so, and then you start chewing it and the, there's a, the cell wall of the broccoli gets broken and it releases an enzyme called morosinase that interacts with the glucoraphanin that converts it into sulforaphan. You swallow the benefit. But if you try, talked about it, if you try to harvest it and put it in a capsule, it degrades because it's not, um, it's not stable. And so, um, and so we basically, um, the glucoraphanin can also be called sulforaphan glucosinolate. In all of the cruciferous vegetables, there's a whole family of molecules um, called ice, uh, called glucosinolates, which are the precursor molecules. So glucoraphanin is a glucosinolate. And then uh, sulforaphane is what's called an isothiocyanate. And so on the label, they call it glu uh, the most basically, prob I'd say probably 90% 90, 90 of these broccoli supplements say uh, sulforaphane glucosinolate, which literally, it looks like it's sulforaphane, but it it's sulfurophane precursor, basically. And so, um, so yeah, that it's, it, it's massively confusing. Can you, can you spell, actually, could one of you actually type that name? Yeah, someone's asking here, can you spell these that you're referencing? Can you type the one that we want to look for that is not the correct one, the one that is not bioavailable and that is actually going to degrade and is the precursor? Yeah, um, let me do that so everyone can see it. That would be super helpful. Yeah, I'll do that. And then it, could I share my screen? Because we have a pretty nice, yeah. uh, we have a nice uh, figure that we could show that kind of, uh, so. 100%. So you should be able to share your screen now. And yeah, it would be really helpful to see a visual. Yeah, so the, the basic idea here is that um, sulforaphane itself 
has an incredible ability to um, penetrate through through cells. It has the ability to be in in um, in the water, so hydrophilic state yeah. and hydrophobic, so it can transport uh, itself across membranes as well. So, because of that characteristic, um, sulforaphane, as soon as you you eat it in the pill form, it gets in your bloodstream and goes throughout your body, and <clears throat> The uh, precursor to it um, is only water soluble, and then you have to have an enzyme to convert it. So the two places that can convert it is um, some of the companies put morosinase in the pill, but what most people um, probably realize is that if you if you take an enzyme and uh, which is a protein and then you swallow it and opens up in your in your um, stomach, your stomach um, enzymes will digest the protein. So there's very little morosinase that makes it through your di um, initial stage of digestion. And so um, what ends up really happening is this precursor molecule makes it the whole way down into your colon and is converted into sulforaphane in your colon. Well, it seems like that should be fine in that, you know, well, it just gets released from your colon. But the one thing about sulforaphane is that it has antimicrobial activity. So the majority of these products you're going to be taking, it's going to go down into your uh, large intestine, and then you're going to be producing sulforaphane, um, probably the only place in your whole body you don't want it in high concentrations is in your colon. And so um, that's sort of how I differentiate between the two. Um, and then also the microbiome is different in each person and their ability to make um, a sulforaphane from the precursor. So uh, it's very variable. And um, it seems that in, in, in most people that really need it, that dysbiotic uh, colon is not able to make it as well. So the bioavailability goes between five and um, maybe 25%, something like that. It's been a while since I read that paper. But um, sulforaphane itself is um, over 90% bioavailable. So to get a consistent dose, um, it's good to just have the sulforaphane itself. Yeah, and so this basically tries, it's a, our attempt to kind of explain it. So basically, right. glucoraphanin is in the broccoli. Right. So you have to convert it into sulforaphan with the morosinase enzyme. Again, all except one other uh, uh, su supplements that are broccoli supplements that say sulforaphan glucosinolate uh, basically don't have sulforaphan. If it says, and even it, there are some, uh, like if you go on Amazon, not that you guys would, but mm -hmm. but others would basically tie it. You can type these companies title it. One says 20 mil milligrams of stabilized sulforaphane in the capsule. And then you turn over on the, uh, the, the supplement facts and it says sulforaphane glucosinolate. <laughs> and so they're, they're um, basically saying that because they're assuming it gets converted um, at a certain percentage. And there's a, that, the paper that John was referencing and it could be you know 5%, five, five we say it's lower, like 5%, um, I think Hopkins, uh, there was one study where they did it like they had the super great morosinase in a cell culture and they converted it, I don't know, higher, but it was, it used, it's, I think the other issue, um, especially if you're growing uh, broccoli sprouts, is when we were looking for um, a broccoli sprout, um, uh, organic bro broccoli seeds, um, we uh, tested a bunch and um, this was 2019, um, and si six of seven um, brands actually had no no glucoraphin, no ability to make sulforaphane, which was pretty wow. surprising. Um, we redid that a year later, and um, we expanded to nine brands. That time, nine uh, eight of nine did, um, and so it was like, you know, it was. It's like, what's going on? So we offer, we do sell, you know, we test our seeds. And so we offer our seeds because not everybody wants to take 
capsules. Not everybody can afford the capsules, um, but every, uh, half pound of our seeds yields 400 milligrams um, at least. Okay. So let's, well, I actually want to, let's pause on talking about eating this as sprouts. I want to actually like take That's a fine. step back and let's yeah. talk about like what sulforaphane is. What does it do? I think of it personally as this sort of master antioxidant, but I know that it has so many other roles than just that. Like, yes, it helps with oxidative stress. And I'd love you to go into why this is an even more potent antioxidant than others. And then what other benefits and other roles does it play in our physiology? This could take the rest of the time, Margaret. <laughs> okay. um, so, Hit list. Having, so, so basically you mentioned antioxidant. So when you take sulforaphane, it, it turns on what's called the antioxidant response system, which is over, it's, it's basically it induces a gene that then makes over 200 different uh, antioxidants. And so it's, it's different than like a vitamin C where one vitamin C molecule interacts with an, a prooxidant and neutralizes it. This is the sulforaphane is, is like you said, the master antioxidant that turns on 200 different, different uh, distinct antioxidants. And it does it for 72 hours, one dose. So that, that gene is induced for 72 hours. And so like, and that Im impacts, you can feel it. I think uh, that's largely uh, like helps with inflammation. So I was um, hiking over the summer and, um, you know, one of the, ours is stable, but if it gets moist um, or it's sort of it's Achilles heel. And so it was moist, got moist. And so I lost my whole, the stash I had for this week long camping trip, like day one. And so like about three days later, I'm like, Oh man, it was, I was hurting um, because it had stopped uh, working. Uh -huh. um, and so anti it has that kind of anti-inflammatory benefit. Um, John, you want to take one benefit? Yeah. So the only thing I would add to the, the antioxidant thing is that um most people don't realize there's many different um, uh, oxidants. So there's um, nitrogen and, um, you know, lipids are oxidized. Um, and because it turns on the enzymes, each enzyme is processive. So one enzyme will um, remove hundreds or thousands of, of oxidants, you know, um, in a process of pathway. So um, it's many different pathways for many different oxidants and the enzymes are processive. So there's nothing that even can come close to, uh, to touching it. And probably most people at this point realize that the antioxidant, um, um, just taking an antioxidant, like the equivalent of ORAC value, um, that activity is, is really not associated with, with, um, with its benefits. So I would say after the antioxidants would be a detox pathway. So that's what um, it was famous for, is it um, turns on phase two and phase three detoxification. And so because it slows down phase one slightly, um, most people when they start taking it don't feel uh, very strong effects of the detox because um, the first step often these toxins are embedded in your system and can't be released, but you have to um, slowly process them. And as you um, uh, move them through the system in a systematic fashion, you can, you can get them the whole way out of your body um, without feeling those, um, what most people describe as like Herxheimer Detox reactions. Flu. Yeah, the flu. And so that's why it's um, um, how it's, most well known, and um, so that uh, detox system is 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 uh, the reason why it's a chemo preventative. Um, it gets rid of carcinogens, and so um, and then I would say that the next one after that is uh, an F kappa B inhibition, and so that's inflammation. So it tamps down uh, inflammation. And I was just um, sharing with David before we we got on the call that. 
uh, there is a new one for me, and it was because of a of a testimony from someone who who had um, a disease that was fibrotic related, and so probably most people know that a lot of the recalcitrant most recalcitrant disease states are fibrotic. So chronic kidney disease, COPD, um, atherosclerosis, they're, they're fibrotic. And that um, processing processing of uh, extracellular matrix and making things stiff um, is, is thought of as not reversible, but it actually is. It has a forward and reverse reaction um, for remodeling your extracellular matrix. And um, NF kappa B, I mean, uh, NRF2 also inhibits uh, uh, TGF beta related um, functions. Uh, the, the downstream effect of that is through a uh, thing called CTGF. And so it's a master regulator of, of fibrosis. So, yeah, the antioxidant response system, the phase two detox, um, the, the TGF beta, all of those are, are regulated by the NRF2 pathway. And so sulfurifen is actually the best natural molecule at turning on NRF2. Uh, and so one other thing that NRF2 does is it regulates tight junctions, which are the barrier, especially in your gut, but also in your brain, um, that keeps, you know, what should not be, you know, in there, which should remain out, out. Um, and so, so, you know, we, one of John's areas of research is looking at glyphosate, so the active ingredient Roundup. Um, so he showed that glyphosate actually reduces NRF2 30 percent, um, which, you know, and that may not sound that much, like that that's that, that high, but it, but it's enough to basically, if you think about every cell in your body has NRF2, has phase two detox, and glyphosate basically turns it off. Um, it, it's basically, you know, glyphosate is, is essentially um, the mother of all toxins because it makes every toxin that much more toxic because you can't detox. Um, he also looked at um, what are called gap junctions, and those are that's responsible for cell cell communications, uh, so intra cellular communication, um, and so it's like. The gap junctions, if you get like get a cut, how does your body know to, to kind of join back together because it communicates, right? Um, and so the um, the glyphosate actually reduced the, the gap junctions, I believe, 50%. And so, um, and so basically, that's if you think about what cancer is, it's, the, it's cells losing their way. Uh, stopping communication with other cells. Um, and so, you know, the, 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 the thought is that that's, that's, you know, the communication is important. The, um, the sulfurifen basically uh, rever reverses both uh, glyphosate's impact on NRF2 as well as um, its impact on the gap junctions. Um, and so I'd say the one of the, non nrf2 related benefit that we talk about is the stimulation of bdnf brain derived neurotrophic factor yeah and so, um so that's pretty big because bdnf is at the center of of brain health it helps um with the protection of existing neurons as well as it actually can help grow new neurons which when i went through science classes that wasn't thought possible but now it is known to be possible and so there's that that's basically that um neuroplasticity and so a lot of people who take our product probably about a quarter of them uh, have vivid dreams and that's the bdnf um basically where, where people are like how do you know that this works. I don't think it's working. And I'm like, did you have any dreams? They're like, oh my gosh, you're kidding me. So I want to talk about sleep. This is, you, you've given me the perfect moment. So what I want to share is my personal story and how I was introduced to this product. Um, I mean, you, so 
you know, just the, the full background. So David and James, Matt, my husband, um, Matt and James came home all excited about the supplement. Now we get sent a lot of supplements and a lot of different brands. And, you know, there's times where it just gets to be a little bit overwhelming, um, all the different things to try. And I looked at them and I kind of didn't fully understand it. And I kind of brushed it off a little bit. And I was just in the process of trying other things. So I like to try to be as scientific as possible and try one thing at a time. And then um, David and I met in person at an event and the, I don't remember how David, but the conversation of sleep came up. And um, as some of, I, I've talked about my sleep stuff before, I'm, I, you know, I, I get very good deep sleep. I fall asleep very easily, but then I wake up um, and I can be like wide awake and I've done all the things, you know, all, all the things. So for all, all the practitioners here, I know we, we, we know all the things to kind of test for and look for. I've done them all. And nothing was really working. And David was like, oh, you know what I do is I like to use these three particular products together um, and I keep them beside the bed. And then if I wake up, I take them and I go back to sleep. And I literally leaned in and was like, do you have those products with you? (laughs) And he said, yes, I do. And I said, could I have some please? Because if this works, I will be delighted. And so I tried it and I started taking them, not not only keeping a little stash of them beside the bed, but also started taking, I thought, well, if it works in the middle of the night, it probably works really well before going to sleep. So I started taking them before going to sleep and I will share the the three products. So there's a Brock Elite, which is just the straight sulforaphane. Then there is the Burb Elite, which is Berberine, which we know helps manage blood sugar along with sulforaphane. And there, there might be other things. So of course, David and John, correct me if I'm missing anything. And then the third one was the Sleep Elite, which again, more sulforaphane, I believe also Berberine in there. And then a couple of things for sleep, which quite frankly, for me, have never worked on their own. Like I think 5-HTP, some tryptophan, I can't remember, maybe some ashwagandha or some, some adaptogens in there. And so that's part of why I had looked at the sleep elite bottle and thought, I have tried all of this. What is sulforaphan going to do to like enhance my sleep? Well, um, David got a very excited message from me when 10 days later, I had slept through the night for 10 days in a row. And I mean, this hasn't happened since I had my first daughter 10 plus 10 and a half years ago. So I was very excited. And I will also share that I ran out of a couple of those key products. And for the first few days, now you're explaining the 72 hours. Now I can see why it took a minute for me to feel the impacts. But after a few days, I was like, oh, I'm I'm really missing that. And now I've got them back in. I'm sleeping great again. Everything is good. So can you please explain to all of this, like the impacts, these are incredible impacts of everything that you're talking about with the inflammation, the detoxification, you know, the oxidative stress, the neurological pieces, how does all this fit together and make magic happen when it comes to sleep? Yeah, I don't think there's a, there's a, a quick answer to it, but, um, many small hints along the way. And, um, one of our, our favorite words that we use around here is synergy. Yeah. So, um, one of the reasons why our product um, works better in, in your hands than our competition is our competition really just has sulforaphane in it. So yeah, they're the it's br- called uh, we call it bro, but they call it Brock, uh, B R O Q. So it's they do a chemical extraction uh, to to get just sulforaphane. Okay. So we go uh, water extraction um, and get everything. So we they're there. Uh, how many isothiocyanates or like 11 11 different ones that work together okay and so the um the the first synergy is within broccoli there um um is sulforaphane then aitc uh, bitc there's a whole series of isothiocyanates and then we combine it with um an isothiocyanate from another um famous uh cruciferous vegetable um, watercress, that's P-E-I-T-C, and we've shown multiple times that they work synergistically. And so when we measure it um, in vivo in a person, we see induction when we don't see it ever in any other product. Um, so I can directly measure NRF2 um, nuclear translocation in, in people when they take it. So that's the first step. John's the only one here in the world that can do that. And people, you and if you're reading about NRF2, 
they basically it's animal study and they have to sacrifice the animal. Oh, okay. Yeah. So then, um, specifically in sleep, um, as you probably know, um, mm -hmm. if you talk to someone who, who, who studies sleep, like I, I study uh, blood pressure and so there's daytime blood pressure and nighttime blood pressure. And so your circadian rhythms, um, are so important. Your daytime, uh, entrainment with, uh, with light, Mm -hmm. And then the transition to nighttime and then during the nighttime, um, your, your um, heart rate slows down. And I like to talk about simplistically as um, your mini hibernation. So when you, when you take um, the combination of sulforaphane, um, PEITC, berberine, um, and uh, the adaptogens that are in ashwagandha and specifically um, um, triethylene glycol, the, the, um, the, the compound that makes you sleep in ashwagandha, uh, that change from day to night is really essential. So the other, the other cofactor is a methylation donor with TMG, and then also paradoxal 5-phosphate, P5P, and then um, the dopamine precursors. Uh, so, so dopamine increases at nighttime. And um, so it's pushing a whole bunch of systems in the right direction. Your, your blood glucose goes lower. Um, you, your um, system is, is shut off slightly so that, you, um, so that your temperature will drop, your heart rate will slow down, blood pressure goes down at the right time. Um, and so all, all those things simultaneously are, are, are pushing uh, the system together. Um, maybe a good a good paper that's talking about this uh, is recently they've been measured paradoxal 5-phosphate and, and shown a correlation with um, low P5P being associated with um, people that have slow, uh, short sleep duration. And um, you uh, can take uh, P5P, but you don't want to take too much because if you go too high, it starts um, in your sleep duration increases, but then uh, if it's higher still, it goes back down. So it's a, it's a, you know, there's a peak at your peak uh, serum concentration. So uh, pushing it, but not pushing it too hard, pushing it together with, um, you know, the methyl donor. So, uh, all those systems moving simultaneously, we think, is why uh, it, it you see success when any single one is is not working. So even in the TMG, there's you know that's trimethylglycine. So glycine uh, turns off GABA. GABA is an excitatory neuron neuronal network. So it's just it's just pushing gently on all all the right molecules. Yeah, and so that's a beautiful way to describe it because that is, I mean, I, I, I've tried, it feels like pretty much every single sleep supplement on the market and that, that it was a very different combination of things than anything that I've seen before. And, um, really, I, I love the way you describe it of just sort of gently pushing on all of the different variables that help to sleep. Cause that's what it felt like too. It wasn't like, you know, sort of super dosing melatonin where, melatonin where you're just like knocked out and comatose. I mean, it felt like a very deep, natural, beautiful sleep and vivid dreams. I've always had vivid dreams, but they've definitely, they're, they're, they're rocking right now. I'm solving the world's problems in the middle of the night. <laughs> yeah. And so we, we've, I mean, the, the market, it's sort of anybody can get a, any rare variation of a melatonin product. And so we wanted to release something with both sleep and mood. And mm -hmm. so a lot of people, I mean, we'd call it yeah. mood. You can't talk about depression or anxiety because those are, um, and against FDA, those are conditions. But, but so basically a lot of people with mood issues can, um, uh, have the inability of methylating the B vitamins. Yep. And so, um, and so the methyl donor, the, uh, the TMG basically, you know, in, if you have a lot of methyl groups, it can help drive the methylation uh, process. And of course, P P5P is a methylated, uh, B6, I believe. Yep. Um, and, but yeah, we would have all the 
B vitamins, methylated. It just didn't have room in the capsule um, to do that. So, um, and I will say too, with berberine, you know, all the berberine products can help with sleep. Um, ours is just a bioavailable version uh, of berberine. And so that's a differentiator. So basically, um, and we kind of stumbled on that from, uh, I was one, you know, in, into keto and wanted something to kind of help push keto um, and just drop the, uh, drop my blood sugar glucose and went, planned out to folks who had purchased it to get some testimonials for marketing. And there are like 75% of them were for sleep. And I'm like, what, what is going on here? <laughs> so I looked at the literature and sure enough, there's uh, this really cool paper comparing berberine, just regular berberine with um, Valium as a sleep aid. And, it, and berberine was superior to val again, uh, versus Valium as a sleep aid. Um, increasing, if I memory serves, um, dopamine 25%. And then serotonin, um, thirty percent, and um, and so you know, that you know that's why ber uh, the berberine product is uh, in the sleep late. But again, what we we try to do is get it across the gut barrier so that um, there's you know effects uh, that are more uh, basically instead of a month, it's within hours. Yeah, that's great. It's funny, I had written a question earlier on how does this compare with glutathione? <laughs> but now glutathione sort of feels like sulforaphane sort of like poor little cousin or something. But I, I still want to ask that question because some of these pieces, like I think about that sort of master antioxidant supporting detoxification. I know it's different pathways, but can you can you explain? It was actually when I the very first time I heard of sulforaphane was in the context of a conversation about uh, glutathione with, um, with a genetics lab that we were working with. And she was like, oh, you think glutathione is great. We've switched everybody to sulforaphane. And I was like, oh, interesting. So can you just comment on that a little bit? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to remember that one for our marketing. Glutathione is the poor little cousin. <laughs> <laughs> um, John, you jump in there. Yeah. So there's, you know, a lot of the uh, disease states that, um, are, are associated with toxins and toxin accumulation. Um, some of those are uh, the single nucleotide polymorphisms um, in, in MTHFRs, the, you know, that, um, uh, that whole pathway, and as well as glutathione. So um, sulforaphane is, is in, it's not just inducing glutathione, you know, the actual tripeptide that is the master the direct max master antioxidant, but what you're you're conjugating um, and carrying molecules with. So the glutathione um, trans transferases, so it's moving glutathione after it's conjugated to its toxin back out of the cell. Um, and so it's it's moving that entire system, not just providing the direct molecule that binds to the toxin. Um, if that toxin is is um, outside of the cells, um, say IV glutathione does a great job. It, it binds that toxin, it's probably um, inactivated. It's gonna help the person a lot. Um, um, one of the things that's not very well known is that um, even though there is a good transport system for taking glutathione that's produced inside the cell, to get it outside the cell and then transport it back into urine and into into um, the colon lumen uh, to get rid of it. Um, there isn't a transport system bringing uh, intact glutathione into the cell. So um, it doesn't go into the cell. So that in order to make glutathione, you um, have to assemble the, the peptides inside, inside. So that's why most people take and acetylcysteine is that um, cysteine, like most amino acids, have to be um, have to be uh, acetylated first before it can be transported across across the membrane. Um, cysteine is the rate limiting step for production of glutathione. So, um, similar to, to glutathione, NAC um, is able to is able to uh, um, increase the 
the amount of intracellular glutathione. Um, yeah, a lot of people don't know about the the other properties properties of NAC, so they disrupt um, mucins, and um, and it's a pretty strong reducing agent. So um, uh, I use it in the lab for a lot of different uses. Um, but yeah, so so sulforaphane really is, stimulates that entire system instead of just increasing one component of of that system. That makes so much sense. That really helps. Now, um, I'm aware of time. I want to make sure I see a lot of questions, and I really want to make sure people get to ask you their questions, and it's not just my questions, but I want to talk first. Is there, I mean, hearing all of this, I sort of think, well, who, this this must be perfect for everybody, right? Like this this feels like it's a, a, a supplement. And I actually see, I just saw a question go by about somebody who couldn't tolerate it. Uh, Teresa said that she got this very excited about this product after you did, um, a, I think a podcast or webinar with Chris Kresser, um, but her husband couldn't tolerate one cap a day of broccoli. Um, and she took two caps a day for about four months, didn't see significant changes. She suffers from chronic knee pain from osteoarthritis. Broccoli didn't help with that. Could be, could it be that I needed one of the other products with additional components? I stopped using it because it wasn't cheap. What I want to ask here is, is it, so I want to ask a number of things. Is it contraindicated for anybody? Like, are there certain people, could it be that her husband has something that is contraindicated or maybe he's taking another supplement or there's a medication? Like, is there anything that we need to be aware of clinically as practitioners when we're recommending this to our clients? Um, is there anything, anyone who is not a good candidate for this or where they might not get results? And if they're not seeing results, is it that they need to do more? I know you have different levels of strength in your products. You have a professional line now that is, was likely not available at that point. So can you, can you speak to that piece a little bit, please? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll start and then John can jump in, but so basically, um, you have people who are, it's, it's so strong. Mm -hmm. They can't tolerate it because it is, it's loaded. Um, so we have a kid's version. So as John mentioned, uh, the plus in, in uh, we added uh, the uh, uh, PITC from Watercrest. And there's this amazing synergy that happens with uh, sulfurifin. So synergy is like one plus one equals five. Um, this versus the additive effect which is one plus one equals two. And so, um, and so, and if you can't tolerate it, we uh, we have a kid's version, which is really kids plus adults who can't tolerate it. Um, that does not, it's half the dose of the sulfurophane and doesn't have the PITC. And so um, that's a good uh, option to try. Uh, then, um, and then, you know, if, it, if you're not seeing an effect, you know, it, it, our stuff is expensive. Um, I, I help make it and it's, <laughs> we do everything in our, in, you know, in Charlottesville. And so it's pretty backbreaking to make. And so, um, but it, it, it um, but so if it's not, if, you know, if it's not working, um, the other synergy, synergy is with curcumin. So we have uh, um, the most bioavailable curcumin product, which everybody says that, but we actually tested everybody's. Um, and and, and it, it, we're, we're a lot, a lot better. Um, and so those two taking broccoli and curcoli together, um, I would say would move the needle, um, alternatively, or in addition, probably, um, you know, one of the things we also stumbled on is using D a poultice with DMSO to do a topical, um, sulfurifin. And so basically it gets, you know, rubbing it on the trouble spot. So like, um, I surf and so but I came up with it because my shoulders were killing me one day because I wouldn't get out. Um, and just, so I just, just did it and it just cut it, cut the pain like in a snap. Um, and so that, but again, you know, uh, rule of thumb for if somebody's not, it's, uh, if it's not, if you're not feeling it is like, a lot of these disease states, you know, osteoarthritis being one of them, take this years and years of formation, typically. And so, um, you know, I, in general, um, it, 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 uh, there's not like a silver bullet. Um, but yeah, I would just try, I try, try it together with the curcumin product and 
whoever had have that question, let's say just reach it, reach out to customer support and we can try to comp you some bottles since you they didn't work for you. We can just try to see if it does because you know they are expensive. We just want customers who it works for. Absolutely. Um I was just yeah. going to say quickly, the, the other thing I would try if, if it wasn't working for you, um, I just know this from my um, blood pressure work, is that um, almost all blood pressure medications should be taken right before bed. Um, and um, I don't know how to say this delicately, is that if if your sympathetic system is in overdrive, which I would say more than 50% of people now do have that, um, your, your, that sympathetic overdrive that you're in right now can, can overcome many healing modalities. And so until you figure out how to, to get your parasympathetic system, um, stimulated and that, uh, and that sympathetic system calmed down, um, a, a lot of the systems that have to do with pain are in that area. So, um, there are a number of modalities that um, you can do um, for for that, and um, uh, I would say that sometimes, if something's not working, that 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 does work on a large number of people. That it's it's shown in 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 studies to help osteoarthritis, and so has curcumin shown to to, to help with osteoarthritis, mostly because sulforaphane gets into the bursa. It actually will penetrate into the into the to that space where most places can't get there. Um, would be to to um, possibly try to think about um, taking your sulforaphane and your curcumin before bed. Um, because getting getting that really good rest um, can can make you uh, your day and nights uh, more um, different from each other, and so um, uh, of course there's lots of ways to do that. You know, yoga and and meditation things that can calm down that. But the sympathetic overdrive is is you know in the center of a lot of uh, pain related issues. And I, I think it can override um, the, the signaling pathways that I'm talking about um, pushing. Yeah. And so, uh, so the broccoli can help lower blood pressure. Um, so if you're on a blood pressure med, you want to, uh, it's not contraindicated, but you want to be careful. Same with, if you're going into surgery, it's, it does, uh, it's blood, blood thinner, um, not super, something to be worried about but just to be cognizant of and that's it those are the and then if you're allergic to broccoli you shouldn't take our product so if somebody has sulfur issues or a sulfur allergy any issues there i mean it depends on the allergy i um i'd say probably if it's like anaphylactic i wouldn't try it if it's just um if it's you know we've had people try it and it's been fine so and but um, some people try it and haven't been fine. So I'd say, you know, just uh, if you can can want to just dip your toe in to see, just uh, then you can try it. But um, yeah, the sulfur in adult broccoli is quite high, but in um, the source where we have so little of it actually makes it into the final product. There's there's very little sulfur. Yeah. You know, very good to know. Okay, so. I have more questions, but I want to make sure everyone else gets an opportunity to ask theirs as well. So Steph had shared here a supplement that she uses the, on the bottle. It's broccoli sprout concentrate, and it says 100 milligrams of brassica, oh, I'm not going to say this right, oleracea italica, whole plant, and then standardized to contain a minimum of 400 micrograms of sulforaphane. What are your thoughts on that form? Would that be what we're looking at here, or is that not going to be? That's That's based... Uh, then when it's just standardized, they're just ballparking it based on the glucoraphane content. It Got is it. not converted. If it was converted, then it would degrade and it wouldn't, there'd be none. And Got so it. we've tested, and this is the thing, like we say this, we show the graph, you know, no other products, no other products. And, 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 and inevitably, you know, after a talk, a uh, clinician will come up and be like, well, what about this product? <laughs> and like, let's see the bottle. You know, and we pull it up 
Uh, and sure enough, it's it's glucoraphanin or gluc- uh, sulfuric and glucosylate. Okay. Yeah, okay. and we actually, the, the places that um, test for sulforaphane, we actually, you know, a lot of people say, you know, we have to get a third party tested. Well, we've had to teach every third party that we worked with how to how to test for it. Because I, I run an analytical core facility and know how to do testing. And okay. no testing facility can separate uh, sulforaphane from sulforaphene. So no one has, has the right uh, concentration on their bottles except us. Okay. That's really good to know. And you all heard my, um, I read John's bio. It's a, he, he knows what he's doing here. The years and years and years of experience. Um, we're getting a lot of questions about the, pro- the products. How do they get them? Can we, um, I'm going to ask some more clinical questions, but do you have, um, I know you've got a little something special for restorative wellness practitioners and I don't, do you have, is there, where is the best place for them to learn more about the individual products? And I will make sure that when we send this out, I will send you the protocol that I use for my sleep. So you all have that. Um, I use right now, so the, I use the quercetin product, the Quercet Elite. I use that in the um, as for my quercetin, and then um, in the evenings, I use a combination of their Sleep Elite, Burb Elite, and Brock Elite. And I usually use is the Brock Elite product that has the curcumin. Is that available now publicly as well, or is that coming out soon? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So basically. Um... We were trying to do it for you guys, uh, and we're almost there, probably a couple weeks out. But basically, did our, redid our labels. Uh, main issue, I mean, we do have some docs we work with, um, and they always complain about, well, you know, we sell it, and then they go to Amazon, and then we... And, and so basically, we have a uh, professional line, which basically is stronger, um, has uh, more of the chemicals in it, and we came up with a different label. And uh, our parent company is called Epiceutical Labs, uh, but we changed the name to Mara Labs because everyone called it Epicutical Labs, and which kind of was upsetting. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and and so you know, Epiceutical being epigenetic, so right. the idea of how um, you know our environment changes our genome. But um, so basically we have a practitioner label uh, under the Episcopal Labs uh, of all the products. Um, It's their stronger. um, And um, and then you can, uh, I'm putting the lady's name in, uh, Christine, Christina Stelling. Uh, She she is, uh, that's in in the chat. Um, she is our whole, uh, uh, practitioner, um, person that sells wholesale to practitioners. And then, um, hopefully next week, it might be two weeks, but we're almost done uh, a site where you could, uh, drop ship, ship site you can send basically your, uh, clients, um, to, um, and you can, uh, contact Christina and she can, um, Basically, if you want to do that side, we can get get each of you your own code, and then um, it, would, it, would, it would be, it's basically an affiliate program. So you get a, a kickback, um, but it, so it's a win win win. Um, so that's it. so if you're interested in that, interested in getting getting it directly, you can get it from her at a discount, being a practitioner, and then also um, if you want to do give it to you. Um, your patients, uh, you can give her your name and we'll, um, put you in the queue once we, you know, in a week or two, once we have that website. up. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I'm going to include all of this, um, in when we do send out the reply, I'll send all of these things, um, all of these resources so that you can start ordering, um, I would love to throw, are you able to share Christina's email in the chat so that folks yeah, were it's, here it's live? There. I, I just did. There? Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm not seeing it. It's, is everybody it's, other people seeing it? Did you send it to everybody? 
I send it to just Angela Lopez. Sorry. <laughs> oh, if you could send it to everybody, that would be fantastic. Just so that, um, because I know um, you might want to warn Christine, she might get a, a, a bunch of emails, but um, you know, She's for getting good. wholesale access, that would be fantastic. Um, and I will, um, we'll share that protocol. Okay. There you yeah. go. There's the, there's, there is Christina's email. Um, so grab that and you can reach out for a wholesale account. Now there's some other questions here. I wanted to make sure we got to as well. I saw a question for me as I'm looking through here about my sleep, because I've talked about sleep stuff historically, and I've talked about a magnesium product that was very helpful. What that magnesium product did is it really helped with my deep sleep. And that was one of the reasons, you know, I wasn't getting a lot of sleep because of this waking in the middle of the night. And I feel like my deep sleep was what kept me going and um, allowed me to function. So now I still get this deep sleep, but now I actually sleep all the way through the night um, and I'm getting just much more quality sleep. And it also means that I don't need to have such a big sleep opportunity. So I don't need to have so many hours in bed in order to get the same kind of sleep, which is an incredible difference for me. So that is the way that it that has worked out for me. Um, there's a question here. Carrie has a question about the SNPs and how that can impact sleep protocols, positive results even with them. And this is actually triggering me because I can remember hearing um, in another resource where you two were being interviewed about the impact on um, genetic expression, right? And the histone acetylation process. Can you share a little bit about this, about sulforaphan and how it impacts um genetic expression probably the most um <clears throat> famous studied um member in this pathway is cert cert bond so it's a histone deacetylase that's been associated with longevity and so probably as a quick summary of how that works is is um if you get a double-stranded break in your dna um the same uh, protein complexes that um, make you remember the on and off state of your genes in, in your differentiated cell uh, are also shared to the DNA repair for double-stranded breaks. So every that's the connection between oxidative stress or you know ionizing radiation, um, where when you get these DNA double-stranded DNA breaks, you you distract. Um, your remembering genes, epigenetics from uh, uh, the rest of your genome. And so, you know, recently there's been all these um, uh, DAM methylase, uh, uh, DAM age, um, GRIM age. There's, uh, so th those are measures of your epigenome. And they're associated with how old you are, how closer you are or further away from. Um, uh, chronic disease states. And so uh, CERT1 is a classic one that um, is is going to make you remember uh, which genes are on or off um, and make you uh, be younger for longer. So it is it's for sure at least in the in the um, in the uh, health span space. Um, for humans, I think it's still yet to be determined whether it is is actual longevity. But uh, so CERT one is is one of those histone deacetylases, and and um, uh, so forafin, uh works very clearly in that area. And one interesting area of that of that um, research for sulforaphane is that sulforaphane turns on NRF2, but NRF2 uh, goes on to uh, work on the epigenome, your, uh, uh, but it also goes back and turns on to itself. So NRF2 turns on NRF2 and opens up the chromatin space for NRF2 to stay on. So if you consistently take sulforaphane and you get this antioxidant um, response elements turned on for a while, your epigenome is more likely to, to be uh, on in that state uh, from then on. So that is how we think that uh, 
it's how we pick the name Epiceutical Labs. It's a nutraceutical compound that works on the epigenome. And uh, that's actually sort of a central feature of how we think it works. That's incredible. There are so many self-reinforcing loops that work the quote unquote wrong way. Um, when I think of like pro-inflammatory loops. So it's lovely to have something that can kind of flip that and actually have it working in a much more beneficial way. It was beautiful. Um, there was a couple of questions about this with cancer. And I see that Teresa is asking a question now about, is it safe to recommend to people with either active cancer or with a history of cancer? Um. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I've seen that I've seen that come up in the in the um, research lately, and I think it's 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 misguided. Um, all of the cancer models is kind of one of the things that I do. Is um, you take cancer and you you grow it in a culture dish, and then you scoop up those cells and and plant it into a um, mouse that's a skid mouse, so it's severe um, combined immunodeficiency mouse, and you grow it. And uh, so what they're doing is they're uh, overexpressing NRF2 in those cells and then um, do, doing that model in, in C and then putting drugs on them, right? So that you can see how that system is a kind of a flawed system in that you're taking a, a cell line that is cancerous because it um, the person most likely died because they didn't respond to chemotherapy. So their NRF2 is low. And then you take a gene and overexpress that one gene in that cell line. And then that cell is able to detox. And then you put chemotherapy on it and say it's worse. So it's a, it's a funny model. And so when you take sulforaphane um, in a person that has cancer, as I'm sure you know, that that model is that they've cured mice of cancer in at least a thousand papers. But in humans, um, that initial tumor that forms is very different than the tumor that kills you. So the way that um, the, the tumor becomes metastatic is that it, in, it increases its ability to be more like a cancer stem cell. And the reason why those cancers are all deadly is because they have this cancer stem cell phenotype. And all of those cells are known to have what's called MDR, um, so uh, multiple drug resistance. And so that was why we developed sulforaphane. It's known to turn off the MDR phenotype. So it makes that cell not pump out the xenobiotics that are, that are given to that cancer um, um, patient. And so it stimulates the immune system. It causes compartmentalization, which is one of the new hallmarks of health. Um, compartmentalization is that you make tight junctions. So you have to lose tight junctions in order to metastasize. You have to leave the primary cell. So we have at least five different functions, You know, turning off matrix and cell proteases, um, it's incredibly strong anti-cancer compound, but specifically in the tumor to metastasis transition. Okay. So short answer there is, yeah, I mean, this is how it was all developed, right? Was with that very specific view to we find. Only, we only worked on people that were stage four cancers. We were able to grow their cells from out of their bloodstream. And that was our model system that we established for, for de developing nutraceuticals. Um, no cell line that you're studying is actually a cancer cell, stem cell. And so there's been no paper showing that they grow cancer stem cells in the lab. So it's just something that's not studied. Okay. Steph is asking, is it safe for somebody who's actively going through chemotherapy? So it's known to be a chemosensitizer. Um, uh, blocks a lot of the side effects, um, but that is clearly in the oncology world. Um, 
because it turns on the antioxidant system, they almost always will say no. Interesting. Okay. We had a, a last question. There's so many things we could talk to you all for hours, um, but I want to respect your time. And I also want to respect everyone else's time here. Do we have, um, I'm just making sure there weren't any other really, I think we answered a lot of these pieces. We didn't talk very specifically about the food part, but I think that that's okay. Um, thank you is what I want to say is for everything that you're doing and this incredible contribution to people's health um, and recovery from all the things. Um, so important and really excited to be playing with these products in different connotations. I know the practitioner community here is going to have a question. Have we integrated them into the healing solutions? Um, we are working on it. We're going to be integrating them into our clinical mastery program first and foremost, because it will fit really nicely into what we're doing there with the genetics and the detoxification. Um, but then we'll of course be bringing them into some of the other, um, levels, especially blood chemistry. Um, we didn't, we didn't, get that in time for this next class coming up in a month, but, um, but they will very likely be there, but thank you all. Take great care. Have Bye -bye. a good evening. Thank Bye -bye. you, John. This is wonderful.